This is the 23rd discussion of this forum with the theme of ecology and community. I'm Pei Yun, today's host, and I work for Global University. The forum will last for two hours. Each of the three speakers will have 20 to 25 minutes and then is for open discussion. When it comes to ecological problems, we can think of environmental pollution, climate issues, species distinction, and so on. The most daunting one is the global warming in recent years. I don't know if you can remember since when. Every year it is reported the hottest year in history. And this year is the same. China has experienced the hottest June in history. And there's no doubt that this July will also meet history. Global warming does not exist independently. It is accompanied by drought, water shortage, land desertification, food crisis, biological extinction. In the past, we said that the ecological crisis was getting closer and closer to us. Now we can say that we are indeed in crisis. Very more and more say that many ecological disasters resulted from industrialization. Some people have encountered water pollution, land desertification, and ecological conservation problems decades ago. The three speakers we invited today, their work is related to water. And as you know, China is rich in water resources, while at the same time, it's also facing problems such as an even distribution of water resources and fragile ecosystems. Since ecological civilization project, water is China's water pollution control, increasing green area and ecological protection have been greatly improved. Our first speaker today is Ms. Yun Jianli. She was, the member, she was a member of the CPPCC, China People's Political Consultative Conference. In 2002, she started the Xiangyang City Environmental Association of Hubei Province. And this organization also has another familiar name, which is the Green Han River. It was the first and only non-governmental environmental organization in in. Hunan in Hubei province. And over the last 20 years, it has grown to the size of more than 50 members, as well as more than 30,000 volunte volunteers. Over the years, they've done work in conducting research and carried out investigation on sources of pollution in Han River. They've supervised if this charge is up to standard and make sure that they have continued to promote environmental education. And next, let's please welcome Ms. Yun Tianli to the podium. Dear friends, hello to everyone. The topic of my presentation today is who doesn't encounter death in their life? I'm going to dedicate the rest of my life to environmental protection. My name is Yun Tianli. I'm from Xiangyang City, Hubei province in China. Xiangyang is located in the middle reaches of Hubei province of the, Huang, of the Yellow River. Yellow River, Han River is our mother river. It has nurtured the people living on both sides of the river for many years. In recent decades, due to the industrialization, as well as the use of pesticide and chemical fertilizers in the villages along the riverbanks, it has greatly impacted the water quality of Han River. And therefore, to us, the protection of Han River is a matter of great urgency. In 2000, in 2000 March, my organization decided to embark on this journey to protect Han River. Green Han River was founded in 2002. It was the first and only environmental NGO in Hubei province. As its name indicates, Green Han River 
our vision for it is to make to make sure Han River is going to be green and healthy and clean. And we have three goals in our work. First is research, second is education, and third is policy advocacy. First, we've conducted abundant research along the mainstream as well as branches of Han River. Over the recent 20 years, we've conducted more than 1,200 researches covering almost 80,000 miles. It's almost as if we've traveled around the earth three times and we've found out different kinds of problems regarding water pollution. And our efforts have greatly alleviated the water pollution problem. We have more than 1,000 volunteers joining us, and we usually carry our own food. In 2006, in August, we were conducting research and investigating water pollution along this small paper mill who was secretly discharging sewage into the river. We were sleeping in the tent at night, and it was really hot, and we were sweating all night, and we had to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Our work in cross-region river pollution control has also established an exemplary case study in this area in China. Our research and continued effort over the years has played an important role in promoting the government's efforts to protect the river, both across all regions of the river. The upper ridge of Han River is, in fact, in the Henan province. And due to our continued effort, the river water now is clear and where it used to be dirty and polluted. We realize that in any region, if we want to protect the environment, protect our rivers, if we only rely on the government efforts, rely on environmental councils and some volunteers, it's never going to be enough. We have to engage all parts of the society. We have to engage the public. And that's why we continue to push for environmental education over the last 20 years. We've done over 1,154 trainings to the public and we've conducted in-person presentations and educate, education trainings towards more than 700,000 people in Xiangyang City. And we've also carried out more than 40 training sessions for free towards teachers and other volunteers and more than 1,000 schools, as well as more than 2,000 teachers have participated in our programs. Besides that, we also carry out presentation towards political, towards government officials. We tell them that while you're pursuing political achievement, you cannot sacrifice the environment. Our water pollution problems are significant. We also do presentations and urge the entrepreneurs to also join our efforts to protect the river. I tell them, if you develop the economy, if you make money, you can never sacrifice in the environment. Even if you created golden mountains and silver mountains, if you don't have the green rivers and green mountains, your future generations, your children will have nothing to eat and drink. I hope you will not destroy what your ancestors have left behind for you and will also not destroy the future paths for your children. We also 
walk into the communities and talk to the people. I also created riddles for the children when we go into local schools. I created these riddles to help the children remember in a fun way why it is important to protect the river. I tell them that Han River has raised us, raised your mothers and fathers, raised everybody. It has provided us with the drinking water. And our great poet Li Bai from Tang Dynasty drinks water from Hanjiang, from Han River, as it is wine. I've created all kinds of riddles related to environmental themes. And so people gave me a title of environmental protection grandma. In 2016, in Xiangyang City, our city carried out a new policy. And I suggested to the People's Congress that the first policy had to be that we have to protect the Han River. And the government accepted our suggestion. And starting from 2017, from May 1st, 2017, the Han River environmental protection guidelines that my organization had suggested and submitted to the government were put into place. I created a, another riddle in which I tell our public that Han River is the source of our drinking water, it's our mother river. And doesn't matter whether in the upper reaches or the middle reaches or the branches, we must not wash our clothes, do laundry or wash our cars with the water. Whoever has violated these guidelines have to be fined and we have to together protect our mother river. We all have to strive to become the model worker and steward. And these are the photos of us carrying out presentations in the communities and advocating the importance of river protection to the public. We also published more than 50,000 booklets helping children in middle schools and elementary schools to learn about the importance of protecting Han River. We ask the children to go home and promote the same idea to their parents, to their family, grandparents, and their neighbors. A lot of our children went home and did this. Some of them go home and not only tell these stories and advocate to their parents, they also go out onto the streets and tell the strangers the same thing. And we asked children to ask people who had heard their presentation to sign their name on their booklets. And some children have come home and reported that they've gathered more than 62 signatures and some of them have went beyond the space to provide signatures. And this is our advocacy letter. And you can see in this picture in the lower half of the screen that this, this student had gathered so many signatures. Some of the parents had taken photos of these letters and posted them on social media. We also done work in promoting the construction of ecological communities 
in various villages. For example, in December 2003, we started this eco-community building project in Wushan town in Beijing, on the outskirts of Beijing. We were living in this village on the outside of Beijing. And in order to save our funding, we were living in the underground, in the basement. And in the evening, it was really cold. And over the years, we've tried really hard to teach the villagers how to separate their garbage. And now it has become a renowned eco village where a lot of people have come to visit across the country. And due to our efforts over the years, more and more Xiangyang people have, citizens have joined us in this effort. And now a lot of citizens often will call us to report a problem if they have noticed a water pollution issue. we have seen real impact in raising awareness among the Xiangyang citizens regarding water pollution protection. River water quality has maintained at the second tier level, according to our national standards. In 2019, under World Environment, Environmental Day, the international panel, which was held in Hangzhou, I was fortunately selected to be a participant. And our chairman, Xi Jinping, wrote a letter with, in which he said, humans only have one earth and it is our common responsibility to protect the eco environment and to promote sustainable development. And that's the responsibility for all countries. And now all countries are trying to implement the sustainable development goals before 2030, but we are still facing enormous challenges in environmental pollution, climate change, biodiversity loss, and other problems. And you're seeing pictures of my interaction with other panelists at the forum in 2019 on World Environment Day. In 2017, March 2nd, Hubei province was the first to implement a new policy. We implement a new policy to identify river systems. I tell myself, because the leader role I've been given, I have to always carry our country and our responsibilities in my mind. And this is my vision to keep fighting this war to protect our green waters and to help and to keep promoting the construction of our water quality 
improvement. And these are the motivations behind my work. And in 2017, I was promoted as the local leader to protect the rivers in my province in Hubei. And therefore, I felt that I've been given an even larger responsibility. I will not forget my intention to protect our mother river, Han River, and to protect our collective, our shared environment. During the pandemic, people will remember the pandemic in Wuhan in Hubei province. But despite the difficulties created by the virus, we still were able to organize volunteers and to continue on our researches and investigation. And we have environmental education base camp here in Hubei. And you'll see us wearing masks. This was this event happened in 2022 this year. We organized an activity to advocate for what we are doing and to protect Han River with the public. We had our presentation in the forest and then we took this photo by our mother river. In the last two years, I'm already 78 years old. But in the last two years, I, I've continued on my work. I've performed more than 168 different research trips. And these photos are showing me my trip to Bai River. I was really happy to see the water quality clearing up. And these are more photos of me on my research expeditions. In the last two years, I've given more than 125 presentations at different venues. In the first photo here on the upper left corner, I was talking to the district committee, to the, to the cadre members. I was telling them that you are given your political responsibility. And while you're pursuing your political achievements, you cannot forget our environment and you have to res be responsible for them as well. And we also bring our trips and team to the villages, to the Chinese countryside, because we believe if China wants to protect and beautify its homes, then our villages have to be protected. Starting from April 2020, we started this new project in Liangpo village which is a village focused on planting vegetables. And we've organized their volunteer team and teaching the local villagers to separate the garbage into the ones that's compostable and the ones that are not compostable in order to reduce the amount of trash and also to continue on our tradition of returning what is able to return to the land. In 2021, I was given the award for my contribution to our environmental protection work in Xiangyang City. And 
and these awards were given to me by the central government. And they also gave me 2,000 yuan in, um, as an award. I was really surprised by that. And it was not easy on this journey at all. I have received calls, death threats from entrepreneurs in the past, but I always tell them, come at me, I'm not afraid of you because I'm doing something important. I'm protecting Han River. Well, I think who doesn't have, who doesn't encounter obstacles in their life? If you don't encounter difficulties in your life, then it's not real life. And how many times can we try our best to combat at these forces? So I treat them as learning opportunities. And last but not least, I want to offer these words to everybody. If we cannot protect the earth, if we cannot if we cannot leave a pleasant home to our children, what do we what do we have use for these golden mountains and silver mountains? I'm almost 80 years old, but I'm I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep fighting. As long as I'm living, my work in environmental protection will never end. And my goal is that on the day when I pass away, as long as I have no regrets in my heart to the heaven, to the earth, then I will die without regrets. We cannot stop the trends of global warming, but the only ones who are going to be hurt is humans. If we don't bring our efforts to save the planet, and in fact, the only ones we, we have to save is us. It's time for us to take action, to make change happen. It's impossible to return our earth to how blue it used to be. But what we can do now is to make sure that our future generations, our children do not have to wonder homelessly around the earth. We have one common commitment, that is to together protect our shared home, our community. Everyone's participation can make this earth a little bit beautiful, a little bit better. Look how this one virus has disrupted our lives. We all have to join into this effort because we only have one earth. Let's make sure our earth is always as lively as it is. Let's all join this effort to protect our water. Let's join hands in this wonderful mission to protect the earth. Thank you. We can say that um, she's um, using her, her life. Once people told me that they might set like, um, like a stone along the river to remember um, my contribution, but I refused that. So if we can tell from her story that if we can um, make such effort as an individual, we can really achieve something. So let's um, invite uh, Professor Chen to come give a few comments.
common. So I have learned a few points. First of all, I would really want to share that in 2010, the first South South Forum, we had invited a few um, guests from abroad to visit Hanjiang, this river. And we can really tell that you have motivated the community, which I see as very important. Firstly, you, you are not only uh, an environmental pro uh, protection granny, but you are also someone who really loves your countryside, your home hometown. As once uh, Liang Xuming said, how could we motivate peasants to participate in rural reconstruction movement? And from your story, I can really say, feel that those who can really touch people's heart and to motivate their action need to touch their heart before we can motivate them to act along us. So at each action, we can tell, for each action, with each contribution, we can, we can pass the future to thousands of generations ahead. Secondly, how we can tell Sometimes we are concealed by um, money. What is more important is the gold, real gold and silver, or mountain, clear water or clean um, air, which is um, how we are challenging the mainstream um, um, ideology. Thirdly, you contribute your effort, your time, your money. You see all this as your family issue, your own issue. And um, it's something that I do it for my future generation and also for mankind's future generation. And also, I also see the work that the coordination work that you did um, are very important. Yang Shu is consider himself is not just a um, computer scholar, but also a Buddhist, Buddhist scholar and also social activist. So what social activists normally do is to coordinate um, different um, aspects of different fields of um, um, people, people from different um, fields, like from the government, um, from um, um, university, from grassroots workers. You have been coordinating all kinds of people to join together, to build connection, to build coalition, to across differences, across different aspects. This is how we can do, which is uh, a very good example for our road reconstruction movement, because we are not just a social activist, we're also bringing our thoughts, our ideas to coordinate and to join different efforts in the society, which really inspires us to do rural reconstruction and also do um, a lot of women's work. So first of all, see ahead of time. Secondly, um, uh, to challenge the ideology. Thirdly, is to coordinate a social movement. Thank you. Uh, what I want to say something. We are a social organization. Last year, um, we have been five. We have been awarded a five-star social organization. So the only one in our city. 
So we are not only an organization that do environment protection, but we are also doing work to harmonize our society. Like some farmer, they reported to us that they have been treated um, not well. So I can try my best to to deal with such like social um, um, social issue, or people have different opinions and and difficulties. They come and and um, they come and 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 tell how much how how, how grateful they are. Like um, in China, we are developing economically, but but there are a lot, still a lot of factory that are doing promotion pollution. We have to um, um, we, ha we have to stop that, and a lot of. Um, as business owner, they hate me a lot because I always uh, report them. But after many years, we become friends, and because I'm also helping them to to transit for their help them to transit their company from um, environmental pollution to being environmental friendly. So. We want to try our best to, to save our river and to still keep it clean, to protect our water resources so that even friends in Beijing could drink um, our clear water. And now mm, I'm like very respected by um, officials. They reacted to my comments and opinions very quickly because I've been highly respected. Yeah, and as I am not earning any salary from my work, I'm kind of like a volunteer. But my health is not good. I spend a lot of money in like seeing doctors. I committed like all my time to this work to environment protection. I have um, spent all my life in this course and I will keep doing that. After we really um, do this kind of work, waste management, pollution, um, alleviation. We tell story of SARS. We also organize games with them. There are many which tell stories of how many species there are with plants, with animals. If we only if we only if we only have human beings in the in this earth, how can we live alongside plants and animals? So we do a lot of activities and games with the farmers and it's also a way to diversify the to diversify the way we motivate and the way we inspire, the way we change people's mindset. That is why um, many people respect me, school, schools and village. And so we have um, one question raised by the uh, audience. First of all, uh, the first one you have your work has motiv motivated a lot of volunteers but they always pay their own like a fee could you share with me your experience 
we have this all has been always our experience bringing our own like bread food that is how we save money so the many people the participant would pay their fee like 30 yuan per person and just use the water from the we bring uh, the pot and we, we bring some utensil just use the water from the river and just cook the noodles along the river and currently right now we have um, earned some donation they have, have some donations from foundations and also from people and have um, have have also received some awards. And I didn't keep it myself. I I, I use it for our association. So this is also a way that the government is buying service from our association. So in a way that we are helping the government. We have received some monies from the government. It's been much better as previously. Volunteers even need to pay their own gas. But right now we have we can receive some compensations from the government. And then right now, if you take a taxi. We can get reimbursement. And some, uh, sometimes I refuse donations as I don't see how much, how how come I need that much, that um, uh, amount of uh, money. But then the the official told me that, well, you can buy some materials like this uh, shopping bag, uh, recycled shopping bag, so people could carry this bag and we have some slogans on the bag. It's also a way to spread our work. work. And other than the bag, we also um, motivate people to bring their own water bottle. So this is this is also one of the souvenir that we have. And if they sometimes I give out the a quiz, and if the answer is right, I would give this water bottle as a, a award as a prize. So this is also how we use those uh, money from the government and buying. So we have enough, I would say, enough money to run our organization. We only have like one full-time staff. Me and also the director of the association. So we are not receiving any salary. We are about to um, print the book. It's um, 20 hundred plus um, pages. This is the 21st. Um, 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 Journal work log that we have produced. You can tell that a lot of the organizations that have done similar work would have like eight to nine staff, but we 
have uh, really stretched ourselves. And some volunteers, if you go out um, to do some research and investigation, we can cover their lunch. Otherwise, sometimes we don't have enough for that. And yeah, we are very try to do our best to, but with a limited amount of money. So the second question is, your connection with uh, officials, with criticism and cooperation, do you, do you share some specific stories? For example, for um, Environmental Protection Bureau, We are, our association um, is part of, um, is associated with um, Environmental Protection Bureau. Before I set up my organization, I was already um, in this course, protecting our river. So if you don't, So I really raise the criticism. If you don't change anything, I'm going to report you to the upper uh, bureau. I really went to the office and asked them, could you really change? Because I'm very like uh, um, a certain. And I, re I, re I can receive some response. They told me that I know that you are very, you are very certain in your work. And after three months, I receive, um, a, we receive this um, license to be a social organization. Sometimes I refuse their offering to offer me a, a lunch. But I refuse that. I, I, I told them that you, you have to really give me the license. Otherwise, I won't receive your, your offering, of, your food offering. For me, it's, it's easy just to get a, a bite from the restaurant. So that is how I receive uh, respect from the, the government because I'm very certain and I'm very strict with them. And I also have this uh, social credit. Sometimes I'm just very being very straightforward. If and I, I told them that if you don't change, I'm going to report you. I am very certain. So there's a lot of these such cases that, yeah, by being very certain, I, I gain their respect and also gain their trust. But I have to let them know that I'm helping you. I'm trying to help you rather than to destroy it or, or disturb you. We are actually just a, a, a nail. The government is the, the one that really needs to um, work or really, uh, really make the change. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you for, for your sharing. And please uh, take care and I welcome you to I welcome you to my hometown. Okay. Thanks. Welcome. Please ring me. Give me a call and I will be there.
I've been everywhere to share my work. I went to do some investigate. I went to do some investigation. Uh, sometimes I receive a lot of warm welcome from local officials and local people. Uh, they have learned to our cases and to change the condition of the water of our mother river. And we also build up a collaboration between these um, um, two cities. And we also have a lot of mutual collaboration. Thank you. Yeah, my health, my health issue is not that well. Welcome, everyone, to my river. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, uh, Kim Chi. You always um, send your regards to me. Thanks all the friends for your greetings and thank you everyone. Thanks, um, Yun sister. She's really like a uh, granny for us. And the next um, speaker, Ying Yuzhen, she won the honor as a national worker model and a national model for combating the certification. For 30, 30, um, um, seven years, she and her family have been planting trees in the Wu State Desert one of the four major sandy lands in China. And so far, more than 600,000 trees have been planted. Once a berry lens without grass is now covered with trees. And Yun's career has also entered a post-desert era. And she began to embark on journey in circular economy. She has established in the Mongolian oasis research control and reforestation company. Built an ecological park, Planted food, vegetables, and food, and food, and build a 1,000 square meter ecological restaurant and a building. After leading a good life, she continued to invest her income in planting trees, participating in various environmental protection activities. Let's uh, welcome you to share her story. Since um, 1985, I arrived in Mu Mu's desert. It's been 30 plus years. Mm. 
little by little to now, if I didn't try my best, I won't, we won't be in what we have today. Um, 2005, I met the kimchi, connect a woman's build this platform and build these coalitions so that I can learn more from other women comrades. Like sisters, we are all like the sun. Thanks to us as women, we illuminate others, we inspire others, like the first speaker. She's almost in her 80s. She still keep all the work. And also is the peace woman in, 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 in China. It's all the years effort. I really uh, appreciate uh, Kim Chi's work. She's also my examples. She has built the platform and the bridge. I don't have, um, I am um, illiterate. I didn't really when, uh, go to school. But I have learned along this year from women in China. Without all these sisters, I won't uh, have the chance to keep growing myself. I see I have a very strong belief. I can um, work to death I don't want to be beaten up by the sand, by the strong wind. And, and as you know, we won't be successful if we just start trying. It's step by step after all these years of hard work. We have, um, we have turned man a large piece of sandy land into a forest and i want to plant more trees fruit trees nut trees and people will ask whether fruit trees could survive in desert Like uh, we have been, we have uh, planted apricots and peach and pear. And also um, cherry cheese and also rose, desert rose. We have planted rose in desert. The desert rose. and also different wine and um, rose uh, cake. This is all the product that we have um, um, produced. We will start um, a park to produce uh, more rose. It's a rose theme park. We have been, um, we have we also have the water that flow across the region. And the water as we deal with the uh, desert, the water became uh, clear and clear. I believe 
with the experience along this year, a lot of the university students, kindergarten students have come to volunteer for us. And I have I have received a lot of volunteers to plant trees in our desert. And also we have welcomed um, volunteers from abroad, from Canada, from Japan. They have participated in, in, this, um, in this tree planting work. Yeah, we have many countries, but we only have one earth. Only if we take care of the earth, we can lead a better life. As we protect the environment, like it's like protecting our eyes. Only if we um, try our best, we can build a better future for the earth. Thanks for Kimchi's um, uh, leave. I have traveled to France, to different countries to share my work. Yeah, you are like our Buddha. You are also, you are also like our guide, our leaders, our pioneers. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Please, I really welcome you to my ecological park. Yeah, we have um, clear, clean water, clean air, and it's very green area. We have built, like as, as um, Pei Yun introduced me, we have built a 5,000 square meter centers. A lot of the training, the local trainings and um, student trainings that are conducted in this park which is different, very different from um, our, the cop house that I, 30 years ago, I used to live in. Thanks for all your support. And um, thanks for your support. And I will, um, I will end my talk here. Thanks, Eugene. After all these decades, you have done a lot of work. And, yeah, I know that you have gone through a lot of difficulties. And you didn't really share that difficult part with us. And I have, when I uh, make this PPT, you told me to put like good photos or photos that seem to be happy photos. So I want to share some videos with everyone that you can see the changes. It was not easy for me to survive in this desert. And I feel the same way for the animals. So I, I'm also an animal lover. Now we are seeing more than a hundred different species of animals in the desert, which did not happen when I was here in the beginning. Now we have more than five different kinds of woodpeckers. Some are red, some are green. So but I feel like time is limited and I've gone over time. I would love to tell you more stories about our animals and deserts. Over the last few years, if we hadn't worked so hard in the past, we would, we would never have the achievements today. Chairman Stipe says, our green mountains and green waters are our gold mines and silver mountains. 
but that's why we are all working so hard together. And also thanks to my team. Besides planting trees and transforming the desert, it is also really important for me to protect the animals. A lot of my animal friends, they would greet me every day and they know my names. And they would smile at me. Um, but my health conditions have deteriorated over the last few years. And I recently went to the hospital and got this medicine. So I hope that more young people will join us. And also I urge all our female companions to, while love the earth, love your careers, but also remember to take care of yourselves. Because if we only can we keep working hard if we have our strong bodies. It's different when you're starting to age and come to a different stage in your life. If you have time, please, friends, come and visit my to visit my farm and estate and we'll treat you with rose tea, with rose pastries and rose cakes that we make ourselves. Thank you so much. These are all the aspects that Ms. Ying didn't mention just now. In fact, besides sand control, she's also participated in numerous education activities and she actually also built an enormous environmental education center. I established this center. I really, I'm really grateful for my teacher. In the beginning, I had nothing. I didn't have a bathroom. I didn't have ways to, to to take care of my own needs. But I hope that in the future when you all come here, you'll have a place to stay. And once we had, once we had a volunteer from the African continent and I was really disheartened at the fact that I couldn't offer the volunteer better conditions. So I wrote a letter to the local government. But how, how can I face these international volunteers when I can't give them a decent food and lodging? And so eventually we got funding to build this education center. And the focus is on environmental education to awaken our awareness about living in a green way. And after the center was built, we have lodging, we also have space to have our meals and rest and that Hygienical conditions have also greatly improved. So I'm really, really grateful for our peace women companions for giving me this opportunity to meet so many global volunteers as well as children across age groups to come to our environmental education center and join our work. And we also 
deliver trainings and presentations to local government officials. In the past, I say it was like living in the underground. The conditions were harsh, but now it's a totally different reality. So once, one year, it was my birthday, and my volunteer friends discovered that, and they secretly bought a cake for me. We were living in the desert. We had a volunteer from England and one from the US, and, and also a sinologist from Canada. We had the birthday party in the desert. It further strengthened my strength and it further strengthened my faith to keep to work even harder. I want to have a farm, family farm, a family. I want to have a family dairy farm. And I also want to build a sand control team. I want to work even harder because of all this help I've received. I miss my friends, especially from outer Mongolia. Once we visited them, once one of these friends came to visit me and in order to come to visit me, he rode the motorcycle for the whole night. So I miss them very much and thank you everybody. Again, thank you, Ms. Yi. And now we're, let's invite Professor Xue to respond. Thank you so much to Ms. Ying's presentation. I've also been to Ms. Ying's hometown in the past at the visit of Ms. Ying Jin. I was there. I saw the desert and I felt I felt the energy and the story of Ms. Ying fighting the desert. And I have two takeaways from her story. Even though Ms. Ying is illiterate, we can, say, we can still say that she's a scientist. She learned by herself how to transform a desert into a green plain. And it's due to her self-learning, her self her own efforts, her experience with interacting with nature, it turned into her knowledge and turned into her ability to transform the landscape, to transform her own life. And I'm deeply impressed by this because right now the environmental problems we're facing, how do we humans deal with these enormous changes in the environment? How do we face into that? So for example, we might, we might have a flood or all of a sudden we have heat spells or temperatures all, all of a sudden lowering. So how do we protect the environment? How do we take action? We often say it's the people who come before to plant the trees but it's the people who come after to enjoy the shade. So while we're planting trees, we're also being the ancestors. We have to think about how to establish the conditions for our future generations to live And Ms. Yi's story has told, tells us how to, how to gain knowledge and experience from our daily experiences and how to act as a good ancestor, a model for those who are to come. 
And her example also shows us that we can transcend our individual limits of knowledge and ability. We can, and we can treat our animal friends and other organisms and bees as our family, as our friends, equally as us. Ms. Yin turned these other beings into an equal participant of the world who she is interdependent with. Her knowledge not only brought us a forest, but also happiness. And this joy comes out of her negotiations with nature and with those difficulties. So these two takeaways. One, how do we learn to teach ourselves how to gain knowledge from our trials? Second, how do we define happiness? How do we redefine our relationship with nature and animals and plants? So I have these two takeaways to share. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shi. Now back to Ms. Yin and see if she has response. Humans living in the desert, it's a very lonely experience, but animals also understand human experiences. Animals, if they, even if they can't speak, they are really intelligent. They know where they can stay and live. Even though they can't speak, if you observe their actions, their behaviors, you realize that they understand humans. I have another point to bring up. Just now, Ms. Yi mentioned that the desert is a classroom. Indeed, it is a classroom, also a laboratory. These knowledge, which are living knowledge, came from the desert. And Ms. Ying turned this language, this knowledge from the desert. She's dedicated her life to share this knowledge with the public. She gained this knowledge not for her personal interest, for her selfish needs, but she went for the knowledge and the skills in order to, to share and to help more people. So thank you so much. Thank you for your analysis, it's very accurate. Because every person has their share of responsibility. If we want the earth to be a pleasant habitat for all, we all have to put in our share. Isn't that a nice thing? Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Yi. We saw kindness and passion for the desert in Ms. Yi's story. We felt the feminine power. Thank you again to Ms. Yi. Thank you to everyone, to all the listeners. And I really hope to see my teacher, Ms. Tie Zhi, and I hope everyone will have a chance to visit us. Actually now in the season where we have the fragrance from different kinds of gourds and melons, we welcome everybody to come. Thank you. So now our last speaker today is Ms. Wang Yongchen. She used to be a journalist at China National Radio. She founded Green Earth Volunteers in 1996, and she initiated programs such as non-governmental programs such as bird watching, tree adoption, and protecting Chinese river dolphins. In 2000, she also founded what's called China Environmental Journalist Salon. And in 2005, she established a newsletter called Green Earth River Watch, sharing information on rivers. 
In 2006, she started the River Decade Project. And in 2010, she launched the Yellow River Decade Project, documenting from a media perspective, the rivers, the changes of the river and also people living along China's Mother River. And she's mobilized nearly 100,000 people, volunteers to join her. And she's published more than 34 books. Thank you so much to everybody. It's an exaggeration, exaggeration that my footprints have touched all the rivers in our country. But we've worked for 10 years along our mother river, Yellow River. We walked two decades with Yellow River and published three books along with it. And together they're called the Greenlands Trail, Yellow River Chronicles, Searching for Rivers, and one more. And right now we're facing global warming and other environmental problems. And the biggest problem we're facing is climate change. What is change? It is that we're facing more and more crises. For example, Germany and Belgium encounter floods and we're seeing fires in California. And as a former journalist, when I was still a journalist, I was using the microphone using my camera to document the changes in China's environment. I witnessed how China's rivers change little by little, usually as a result of climate change. And this picture shows the source of our Yangtze River. And this is at the base of Mount Everest. And I've been there twice in 2001 and 2009. And the first time I went there, it was a beautiful snow-capped mountain. And yet the second time, between 2001 and 2009, just the eight years, I saw how the mountain, the snow-capped mountains, turned into just a tiny bit of snow at the top left. And I was in, I was participating in the 2019 Copenhagen Environmental Forum. We were talking about the third, third pole, which is the Himalayan plateau and how the disappearance of the ice glaciers and the snow-capped mountains it's going to have huge implications on not just Asia, but everyone in the world. Just now, Ms. Yi mentioned the river from Han River. China has been transporting tons and tons of water from Han River from Southern China to Northern China. And here in Beijing, we often say due to that project water, that transfer water project, we don't lack water anymore in, in, North, in Northern China. But we have to also realize that the water levels in Han River have been increasingly decreasing. And every time I've been visiting Han River over the last years, and I've witnessed how water levels have diminished 1998, I visited the Jiangren Glacier at the source of Yangtze River. And just in three years, I noticed how it was disappearing so quickly. And we know that the source of Yangtze River is made up of hundreds of different small glaciers. 
when we saw and when we were there recently we saw the local the tibetan nomads they would carry their yaks when they're crossing the grass and the glaciers because there's no more ice We used, and this old nomad told me, we used to be able to get water right in front of our house. Our animals can drink water, but now we have to walk miles and miles to find water. And look at these pictures. I've accumulated them over the years. What used to be green plains in the past now the yaks have to chew on the ground, bare, laying bare due to climate change. And let's look at more pictures. This is Toto River Bridge. And these two photos shows the change over 10 years between 1998 and 2008. And Toto River is also located at the source of Yangtze River. In 1998, I was there and I was guard. I was told by my companions to be careful with the water. And the construction of, of the Sino Tibetan Railroad has also led to that change. And these photos were published in the, China, in the National Ge Geographic magazine. And we're looking at the yellow, the yellow River, the source of the Yellow River. And let's look at pictures from a year later. We were using the yardstick and we witnessed the significant decrease of water level. This is part of our Yellow River Decade Project. And these are the journalists, journalists who went with us. And we would publish these videos on social media. But after all, we're a small group We're still a small branch of people. What we can do is to protect water source in front of our, in our hometown. But for journalists like me, for journalists like us who are documenting environmental issues on the larger scale, it is our responsibility to share these images and information and to share with the public how the global climate change had great impact on our lives. And just like Ms. Ying told us how the trees and the animals on the deserts would talk to her. In our experiences, we also encountered many animals on our trips. I remember in 2009, I was in South Africa to participate on a climate conference. I saw how a lot of the animals, animals in, on the African continent are in fact very gentle. The lions and the giraffes, the giraffes were idly eating grass, eating leaves from the trees. But when I came back to Tibet and saw how the animals, how wild the animals were. One night we were, we were in Ali region of Tibet. And there were many wild horses, what the locals called them, and antelopes. When you saw these animals, 
亢奋，不是，就是我们有很和动物很温柔的，我们现在家里。Like the animals in South Africa that I saw, these animals were truly wild. When you are, when you are really facing such animals in their wildest nature, it will give you a different impression. It gave me a different kind of passion. It kindled a different kind of passion. For us journalists, we have to reflect on over the course of human development. What is our relationship between humans and animals? What's the impact on animals' life conditions when we are having global climate change? In 2006, I remember. In 2006, Chongqing province suffered from really serious dry spell. And our journalists reported on donkeys who were carrying water for people and who eventually died of thirst themselves. So, humans, when or have we ever paid attention to our animal friends who also live under the same sky? They are drinking from the same waters. Have we ever thought about them? If we do. Think about them even a little. We will realize that all these common climate crises and disasters we're facing, animals are suffering the same amount, just as us humans. Have we cared about their homes? Now let's take a look at more photos. Oh, indeed, some of us have already. Have been working to protect the environment and protect other beings' habitats as well. Now, when I gave presentations, I often ask my audience, "Do you know? Do you know the creator?" Of our rivers, do you know the sources of our rivers? And my mother, she's back in my hometown planting trees with the children in our village. And I've told them the sources of our six greatest rivers in China, and these children can often answer. They they will remember these answers, and they will tell to other people. And in my hometown, oh, this is Lantang River, which is one of our important water sources. It is in the Tibetan region. And you're looking at how Tibetan, how Tibetan people treat the water, which turns red when it starts to rain. Because of its special geological features, when it rains, it turns into red, as if the, ma, the mother's womb is giving birth. And when I was giving this presentation to people in Beijing, in Beijing, I told them the story of how local Tibetan people, when they come to get water from Lantang River, they would often perform these rituals to thank the earth, thank the heaven, thank the earth, and thank the river. And my audience in Beijing would often question me: Why would they even go such length and such nuisance? Why don't they just get water? But Tibetan people understand that it is these natural beings who gave us food. It's in their belief that they know from their heart that they are in a reciprocal relationship. With nature, so we have to thank them for their perspective. And next slide, this is about Han Han River, which is what 
our first speaker had talked about. And we can see how the source, the source of High River comes out of water, comes out of rocks, comes out of these cracks, out of these rocks. And this is a picture. Yeah, we were looking at the water levels of High River. And we've witnessed how the water level has continued to diminish in the, in the last few years. These last few years, the speed at which the water level has diminished has prompted people to think about another project which is to transfer water from Yangtze River to come into Han River to feed people. So these changes, these, these images, we feel as journalists, we have the responsibility to show them to people. And I feel a lot of times our environmental efforts are still only staying at the talking level. Most of the people in China don't understand how seriously our environmental problems have got. So we need more people to understand. And next we're looking at Weifu, which is the largest branch of Yellow River. And this picture was taken back in 2006. I was there first in 2003 and water was, there was plenty of water when I first visited there. This is the Baling Bridge. And back in time, Chiang Kai-shek and Sun Yat-san had both written on this bridge. So we know how important this bridge was. And now I can tell you underneath this bridge, there is not a single drop of water right now. It's all grass. In these photos, and we know that Chinese river dolphins have been announced for its extinction. But this picture, This picture shows another species of dolphins that we have been protecting since 1997. We tried 10 years to protect the species called Chinese river dolphins. And in 2006, it was a nightmare for all of us who have tried so hard to save the species. And this is a picture of Qi Qi, who was the last Chinese river dolphin we tried to save, but unfortunately she had passed away. We only have four species of such dolphins left in the world. You can find them still in the Amazon, in Pakistan and India. And this picture, it was taken when I visited Peru. And at the time we still have a few such kind of river dolphins. And in 2006, she passed away and now she's turned into a case for us to study. Now we're looking at pictures of sources of Sangan River, which also makes up 
along with Yang, Yang River, these two rivers merged to form what in Beijing we call our mother river, Yongding River. And it's also known as Divine Head Spring because due to the forces of underground water and interactions, this water often comes out, sprout, spurting out, and that's why we gave it this name. But unfortunately, it's disappeared. For one, we, as we lose more and more underground water, it's no longer got the pressure or the structure to support this form. To my great regret, that we can see, that we could see a fountain, an amazing natural fountain, but now we can only see a little river. And our children are already quite pleased by this. So I'm really worried that if our future generations cannot see live lions and tigers, and when they can only see them in the textbooks, what would we say to children? How would we feel? So now let's look at more photos. And this is the same Sankan River, where the river just a little less than a mile away from the source, it had been polluted. And this farmer was saying, well, the rice plants we're growing here are going to be sold to you people who are living in the cities. We don't eat them. So what we're getting from the countryside are these polluted toxic food. So can you say the food agriculture has nothing to do with global climate change? Our agriculture is greatly affected by the use of pesticides and chemical fertilizers and from these drastic weather patterns from floods. And all of these come from our interference with nature. And yet, most of the times, we are still taking nature for granted. And the villagers tell me, we only eat seasonal vegetables. Well, where people from Beijing, I've heard what say back to the farmers that, well, in Beijing, we eat, we can eat vegetables all year round. We get them from these greenhouses. So it is true that our lives have become more convenient, more comfortable, significantly, but can our future generations also enjoy the same thing? And now let's look at another picture of the Tongoli Desert, which was taken in 2012. In Mongolian, Tongoli means the heaven. We often think deserts is a dead place. But look at these pictures. The people who live in deserts Just like what we heard from Miss Yi, she's so passionate and we can feel her vibrant energies. We know that deserts also is full of life. Once we visited this desert, and what we discovered was stunning. We discovered 32 chemical plants in the desert and from companies who were discharging their sewage right into the desert. And also, we saw this one thing I learned from deserts. The desert is just like a sponge. 
when it rains, it just soaks up all the water and goes into the underground. We know underground water is alive, but our and these companies, they're discharging their polluted water directly into the desert, into the underground water. So we know how serious this, this is. So which is why we are using our journalist ability and skill to try to influence policy. And next slide is in 2014. We went into the Tungguli Desert again with journalists from Xinjiang Daily from Beijing. And we went to take photos of the desert. And we documented these changes in 2015, I wrote an article titled, Our Deserts Have Turned Yellow Again. So I just talked about how we worked to push policy to change. And we know in China, this, except Lu River, most of the other major rivers have turned into river dams. And this is a map of all the dam projects in China. Our Yellow River Decade Project have taken us across all these different constructions. And this is one dam in Sichuan province. We all know that Du Jiang Yin Dam Project is one of the World Culture Heritage Sites. And we often take great pride in that as a symbol of wisdom from our ancestors. And we're looking at as one species of willow tree on the Yellow River. And we heard the sad news that we had to cut down all these ancient trees in order to build the dam. So we wrote a letter to the People's Congress. And we were able to stop the project and and we urge the government to take a different action, which is to move these trees instead of to cut them down. These trees are trees who live at the highest altitude in the world. They're the tallest and the widest in their diameter for this species, but we, we still couldn't, we weren't able to save them. And this story is very sad to me. And now because of the pandemic, we haven't been able to visit. And I really want to go visit these trees and see how they're doing now. If I have a chance in the future, I would love to tell you their stories. Um, so I hope you got from my story that if humans haven't interfered with the Yellow River, it would have stayed as a beautiful river. And we know in China, we went through a period of developing the West, but we also know that it was, it was a kind of development that added cement grounds to the natural ground. 
was a lot of human interference and has completely transformed the landscape. And I hope our Yellow River Decade Project is an effort to leave behind a small trace of human impact as well as nature's changes across the last 10 years. And this, this group of photos were taken in Tibetan regions in northwestern China, in Qinghai province, Ningxia province, and Gansu province. We saw Tibetan people, their wisdom, and their more simplistic and yet more engaged way of living, and how those of us come, coming from urban cities and coastal cities in China, we often judge them and say how they're simple in a backward way. And for me, in fact, it is their way of living should not be replaced by our modern lifestyle. It's their respect for nature, their relationship with nature in their religious beliefs, cultures, can inspire us. What they want is a slow lifestyle. What is that? A slow lifestyle means a more harmonious way to live with nature. Sometimes we say Chinese people, except for the airplanes in the skies and the chairs we sit on, we eat everything. Once I asked a guru, a Tibetan monk, we shouldn't hurt lives. A little fish is alive. Killing a bull is alive. Now let's look at another picture a portion of the Yellow River in Henan province near Zhengzhou city. In the year of 2000, it was the first time we went there. We used 10 years. And we want to show you in 2016, this is what it looks like. It has turned into a green plain and we have people have built houses on it and here we can see many many hardened surfaces near yellow river which had turned which had hardened because of loss of water And near where Yellow River merges into the ocean, we know it used to be new land. And this is picture showing there are more than 50 dams built along the Yellow River region. And officially, we know the Samanxia Dam project has been officially announced as a failure. Has turned into a river. What does that mean? It means the mud and the sand have continued to build up in the river. I also appreciate the beauty of nature, but why so many of us, when we're traveling, we choose to ignore that. We choose to ignore our behavior and how that can impact the environment. And sometimes people ask me, what does it have to do with you? Why do you worry about the river? And today I'm sharing this information with you because I hope my readers, my audience, 
I hope we can establish, we can reach a common ground on these issues. They are important to all of us. And next, let's look at Ming River. A few other examples. And this is where Du Jiangyan Dam is located. We know today there are many, many academic articles testifying how back in 2008, when we had a great earthquake in Sichuan province, it was this dam that led to the earthquake. wonder if one day we can have a more objective way of looking at this. And this is near where the earthquake took place. And back then we used these big nails to try to secure the mountain when we tried to build the dam, but how secure are they, would you say? And this is another dam. And this is picture from Dadu River. When we were there, the leader of a local radio station told us that this is Dadu River is our pride. But now we, we know that because we built more than 300 dams along Dadu River, the river has been broken up into pieces. And this is a picture of another river called Dadu River. And this is the Luding Power Station. It used to be called Shangri-La, it was used to call, be called, it was like a paradise on earth, but now due to the construction of power stations and dams, it has been, we have lost a beautiful landscape. So between 2005 and 2016, our Yellow River Decade Project, we tried to document how these dam construction projects over the last, over this decade has disrupted the rivers. And look at these photos of our other examples of our parks and rivers, how, look, aren't they as, just as beautiful as the Grand Canyon in the US, for example? But I am running out of, words to describe them, but aren't they splendid? And this is from Yang River. And these are, and this is the place where we see a mixed population of Tibetan, of Yi ethnic minorities and others. And here we witness how it, it's a hub of traditional Chinese culture of these very, of these diverse cultural elements, but now they're forced to leave their homes. So we say it is, it is injustice what we have done, what we, how we have interfered with these rivers. It is an injustice to the river. This is another project. We're talking about the three rivers, Yangzi River, Yellow River, and the Lantang River. The three rivers merge in Yunnan province at Jinsha River. Now, Jinsha River had been 
titled World Heritage. And yet, we also know that there are dams being built along this river. And these are photos of other media outlets who have gone with us on these trips to document these changes along Jingsha River. These places where we've been to, it's the same story over and over. When we first went there, it's a beautiful place. And then a few years later, or the next year, it's turned into a dam, another power station. And these, this 300-year-old ancient village is now underwater. So when we were on this 10-year walk, I often encountered people who would kneel down to the ground too in front of us. And for us, we really feel powerless sometimes. We don't know how to help them. And eventually, gave birth to a series of documentaries. We published the Yellow River Decade Project documentary series to document their lives. And this is another river called Milk River. And because of our documentation and our efforts to expose their stories on the media, we were able to make change happen. It was also very difficult for us. On our trips, we all paid it for ourselves. In the first few years, it was often that we couldn't even afford our travel expenditures. We had to take all that money out of our own pockets. We had more than 100 journalists who joined us in this decade River Walk project. And one of our dear participants, Xiao Yun, unfortunately passed away. And when I shared that news with our companions, everyone felt very sad. And this is a picture part of, of parts of Lantang River. This one is in Yunnan. Lansang River, as we know, is shared by six Southeast Asian countries. And now the construction of these power stations has not only affected our own livelihoods here in China, but also it's affecting other friends from other countries as well. So I invite friends to come to the source to to the source of our Lantang River and to see and to learn from these Tibetan people, how they are guarding our water source. I'm hoping to, I'm hoping to put out this new documentary and to tell people how these Tibetan people, how they are protecting the rivers. And I hope this, and I think if we can complete this project, this documentary project. It's going to be, it's going to be a big contribution even on the international stage. I'm willing to, I'm willing to, sh I'm willing to share our 10 years worth of footage and words with our reader. If you would like to get to know more about Green River Green Earth Volunteers, you're welcome to contact me. 
these photos are, show, are showing the changes at Hu River between 2006 and 2009. And the last we heard about Lu River is that we are going to have a national park here. And we were so happy to hear that news. Even last year, we brought a team to Lu River. And people were saying, if even such a beautiful river, if we were to build a, a dam, a power station next to it, what great loss would that be to us? And it's a picture of children from the local village. They were swimming in the water. When I was there, I asked the children, how many songs can you sing? And they replied, how many stars there are in the sky and how many, there are how many songs that we can sing. And of course, they also have the right to pursue happiness. At least we should respect the fact that they should also be given choices. I can proudly say that that on this map, there were 13 dams to be built, but I can proudly say that it's because of us, our efforts, and they were never built. So you can tell, I'm gonna show you the last of photos. You can see these photos have been taken in the last few years. I once um, did a speech, did a talk in Harvard University and people in the state told me that this kind of river we cannot see in the state anymore. And the same in the Europe, because the Indian culture, the native Indian culture is that, but the culture in New Jiang is still alive. Even the Native um, American community would not agree with it. There are still a lot of um, minority groups along these rivers. They are surviving. Even though whenever I'm sharing about this, not many people are, not many people are paying their attention. I really heartfelt feel that if I can still do something, I would continue. Um, this is the photo taken in 2015. They are also offering this, this kind of uh, water sport. And there's also the, the flower festival, the peach flower festivals, because the stock of uh, dam um, construction and visit the river and see all this um, beautiful landscape. As a grassroots environmental organization, this is what we need to do. We need to protect, protect the mountains and the water. And this monk in the photo, I once interviewed him. He told me that if a temple is destroyed, we can rebuild it. But if environment is destroyed, we are done. And in 2004, in a newsletter, we, we share what is happening in the rivers, with the rivers, with the big rivers. Since 2000, before the pandemic, we share a lot of this case that is on newspapers, but right now we do a lot of these sharings online. 
even like a lot of these sharings is voluntary. And sometimes we still have to invite more audience to come, but we never, we will never give up. And in Beijing, we offer every weekend walk along river, like we call river walk. We um, engage um, citizens in Beijing to share the beauty of the river with everyone and also to share the pain of the river. And since 2007, The change of Beijing's uh, river, we have documented um, what uh, photos we have documented um, um, in words. And children just grow up with us. And all the rivers in Beijing have our footprint. The last couple uh, photos as we are documentary all this, we are like a police. We will report to um, the, the river master because of our insistence, our protests and our worries. We let the river master, we know that they know, they know that the people who report us so that the slogan alongside the river saying um, don't pollute and if we find anyone doing bad things we can report and they realize that wow they're really citizens doing this kind of work so yeah i really want to emphasize to not give up is tough but we never give up there are a lot of university students who do their um, dissertation work on this their dissertation together with us. So my mom lives in um, live in the village three hours from Beijing. And my grandfather is kind of a famous one in um, village. He he's a businessman. I visited the my hometown, the village, a few years back, and um, the village chief told me that my grandfather planted a tree there when he um land food to the um, uh, villagers. They help a lot. He helped a lot the villagers, my grandfather. And I've written stories of this village. And I have written a lot of stories of my family and of the children who are protecting the environment together with me. I've lived here since the last two years. And all the, pub the book I published is related is on the environmental protection. I wish all this book could help people to not only see the changes of life, but also before the changes and after the changes, because this really, um, really, um, is really necessary, and and give you to, to share news. Tomorrow is my birthday in my um, village. I don't know how somehow they. They got, they, they got to know tomorrow is a, my birthday. And my brother's here, he built um, a park. 
And he also circulates some traditional cultures, and traditional paintings. And, and I want to And as I'm traveling around the river, he's sometimes it's a very rushed journey, but I've been rooted in this village for the last two years, together with the villagers, the children, being very grounded. Yeah, we don't have like much grand dreams. So we just would like our children to lead a better life. It's more humanity, it's more like this more romantic life and relaxed life. Thank you all. Yes, thanks, um, Wang. It just feels like if we have been traveling um, with this Wang as a uh, journalist and um, striving for truth, leading a group of people to visit so many rivers, source of waters, and to share these pictures of us. So I would like to invite um, Zhe Chui to give some uh, comments. Thank you, uh, Wang. I have no known you for a few decades as I am seeing all the photos and read your books. And I want to share a few points. As you have um, pointed out, nowadays it's not just about global warming, it's about climate change. And most importantly, it's about systematic change. And it's not just like the outer system, but also this inner, our inner. How could we really um, promote social change and change our human mind? And it's about how we can um, trace back or regain traditional cultures. If we drink water, we'd better think of the source of the water. And, and secondly, as we have drinking water from the Yangtze River, hmm. is it just us who are drinking the water or who, who share this um, water with us? Who are we cohabiting with? As China, like Han, we yes, Han um, ethnic, but we also have a lot of uh, minority group in China. How could we respect their culture, their language? I think there's one thing in common that we all share the gratitude of nature, as you um, share with uh, share a case the example how people in the minority minority group they would they um would give worship and sing and pray for the water before they, they consume before they drink drink it and as one more point like confucius thinking if we um um people who is um virtue admire mountain and people with uh, wisdom admire, um, appreciate um, water. So how could we improve ourselves so that we can um, have both virtue and um, wisdom and to be in one with water and with mountain? I can tell I, I, I believe many new generations would carry on your um, baton. I hope we can also build platforms. Even people in other countries who see your effort, like in um, Lantan River, because it's an international river in the Southeast Asia, and we are facing a lot of similar issues. 
So could we build an uh, international platform um, through the South South Forum's connection so that people in different countries would work towards uh, uh, um, uh, the same cause? We have shared your, your, your speech story in the international um, um, media. Even though we are facing this climate issue, and this um, different group facing different issues, existential issues, existential problems, but as grassroots women, how we treat ourselves and then we want the whole community to join us so that we can do something. So these are all my comments. Thank you. Um, thanks, Xue uh, Chui. Please, um, we invite Wang to give uh, um, a feedback. Now, I have um, more. Um, stories to share. At the beginning, I'm not very confident with my book. <laughs> and people know that I love uh, selling books. And you can imagine I have like this 34 books. And I have been, whenever I go, I bring all kinds of books to sell. Yeah, I, I have uh, used up many of my luggage. So after I've shared stories, I will invite uh, children volunteers to sell books for me. And once I, uh, a government official, bought like a dozen of books. And then after right, I rang up my publisher and told them, that, oh, please uh, bring 10,000 books for me. And um, the public shares were very hesitated and she asked, he or she asked me, wow, can you really sell them out? I believe all this book has it records and documented the history of an, a village in Northern China and its changes. I believe it would allow people to see after years of efforts, we, we, we can not only Inference the policy, but also we can change the life of people. And right now, there's a lot of people that are complaining. And I, but I, but I still believe that there are a lot of the space for us to to to, to interfere, to to participate. Just like South South Forum is such an international forum. I can't believe, and everyone can believe that there are a lot of difficulties and challenge. And what, well, I really like um, one, well, um, I really like this um, sentence, just do it and a step-by-step. As long as we are together, we can make change. I believe many people will really like um, um, Wang, teacher Wang's um, books Be because what she observed and what she documented is something very treasured, treasured. And we have uh, received a few questions. So I want to first one, first of all, Please, could you introduce a bit the books you published? Could you um, share with us? And the first one is about embracing nature. 
And the first, and the, um, also one on, uh, his name is called Wayne um, 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 Kepler. And I also had a book sharing like pandas, um, the canyon in Colorado. And I also write uh, a book on my journey along the rivers. It is uh, since 1998, as I have been traveling to the source of river to um, pat the Tibetan plateau. The third book on, uh, um, is on um, um, stories of Tibetan plateau. As you know, there's a lot of rivers originally originated from Tibetan plateau. And as I more uh, visit Tibetan plateau more and more, I really admire them, their belief, their lifestyles, and I really admire them as in generations after generations. There are a lot of the way to, to work, to live with nature is that I, I think I is very treasured. And I also have a book on um, how in early years, 30 plus grassroots organizations, they are making like such a change and lay such a foundation for later on environment movement. And um, I also have a book published, it's on um, nature reserve. Mm. It, I, I, I name it as um, um, the destruction of the most beautiful area. And it's uh, edited by a few journalists, including myself. Since 2008, we publish um, uh, um, a journalist, an environmental journalist, um, an environment journal. But since 2017, we have to stop publishing this one since, since the lack of um, um, support. And I have written books on, on um, Yellow River, on the uh, Yangtze River. Yeah, and the most recent book is on the village, where, where which is my um, mother's uh, hometown. I recorded the stories and the lifestyles. And I would like to, um, I would like to, I, I would like to compile a, a series of a book that could cover all the continents. But as a journalist, I cannot do big things. Yeah, and that's in South South Forum, there are a lot of uh, um, famous uh, scholars being invited, but I know that my words, unlike uh, the scholar, scholar um, articles, is more like these photos, these words that I easy to read, I hope they could reach um, to um, normal people. So that they could see, so that they could see, people could see um, our beautiful environment and having the stories, storytelling. So if you are interested, please um, find uh, um, her books to read. So could you share with us some um, interesting stories? On in the village, like in your village life, 
Okay, you can come and uh, buy our books. Yeah, people um, used to ask me why you end up living in the village. What's the difference between village life and your city life? I was chatting with a friend this morning. There's one difference I told her or him. Yeah, in, in the city, if you don't like someone, you can just ignore them. But in the village, you can't do that. Every day you see them. I think this is like a characteristic of a village life. It is, this village is really close to Beijing. I, um, I went there in 2020. And yeah, because there's uh, no uh, uh, a bathing or, or like a showering um, infrastructure there. Yeah, and, and some people, they didn't really have like birthday cake. <laughs> and I know that they're gonna, they're gonna make um, a party for me, I already knew that. I don't know whether it's the inference, like a urban inference into a village life, but there are some things. Hmm. But I, I told them to, to, to express gratitude, to say thank you. They said that I ne we never, we never, <laughs> we, but we never really reflected, expressed it, even though we have it in our heart. Yeah, but I, after I, I taught them, they really, <laughs> they really go um, to express thank you and, and good night to their mother, even though they, <laughs> They didn't receive very good response from their parents. But all these stories I wrote in my book. You can just uh, go and check it. I, I don't want to um, criticize them. I just want to influence them with my lifestyle. Even though, even though, um, Whenever I tell them holding their thumbs up, I often feel embarrassed. For these, for these people living in the villages, they don't mind that there's still a little dirt the bowls, but often for people who come from the cities. They mind such details. And and oftentimes we think of them as simple people, and yet we can still be inspired by them, by their passion. Even though they live so simply, and often we even think these, these detailed ways that they don't pay too much attention. And I've heard some of the villagers want to go and study broadcasting and want to learn how to become a TV host. And I was stunned. I, sa I said to them, I used to be a journalist at Central Radio, and you can learn from me for sure, for free. Why would you pay to learn? And they said, well, our teachers asked us to. <laughs> and there are many, many such kind of stories. And over there, people often Oh, 
the little home that I've built, a lot of my friends from Beijing would come and join me. Uh, one more question that um, has the traditions of minority groups, traditions, cosmology, and uh, worldview. Have you? Another question we've gotten from the audience is whether these more indigenous ways of beliefs are they encountering challenges and how can they tackle these challenges of inheritance? For me, society always has to develop and move forward. Of course, there are going to be customs and traditions that are going to be replaced. But whenever I'm in a village, I'm always glad to see how so many traditions are still being kept in these villages, especially like the ones I said, these villages in Tibet. There's a festival among the Hui people and the Tibetan people where every family at this festival, they have to buy a, a cow. And the first piece of meat that a family buys, they would give it away to people, to families who cannot afford to buy a cow. Now in, the, in this village that I'm working with, our volunteer group sent out free meals to all elderly people who are above 85 years old. And we know this one old grandfather who just passed away recently. And in his household, there are four generations living together. And the daughters, they would And for their funeral traditions, the daughters, they would wear a thin strand of white ribbon in their hair. And this is filial pi piety that we respect in traditional Chinese culture. And I think if someone is unfilial, then you should distance yourself from them. And in fact, in my project, we've opened a cafeteria as well. I tell my team members, when they deliver meals to the household who has lost the grandfather, I will go and, and pay respect to him. I will bow to him. I will perform the kowtow ritual because it is to respect their local tradition. And for me, just the sentence, just like the sentence I said, just do it. I'm going to the ritual to him, even though I don't know him, because I respect him. I respect his past. I respect his children. Just do it. It's, it's so simple. I'm going to perform that to him. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wong. Last question is, Ms. Wong, could you please talk about how these, how these small hydroelectric power stations have affected or obstructed the river flows that you've noticed? And for me, back in the 90s, I went to Shenongjia National Park in Hubei province. 
We heard that there was a power station being built. And later, when I went to Lu River, this is Chinese saying that only if the little streams are filled, then we will have a full river. Now we know that if we don't have the little streams in Aba Prefecture in, in, in Sichuan Province, in uh, all these other parts of China, if we don't have these little streams, we won't have Yellow River. But we also know at the same time that along Lu River, there are so many hydroelectric power stations being built, and each one is interfering the river flow. And we know for the Three River Dam project, because of the building of the dam, the water river has continued to diminish. We know the two lakes of Yangtze River, Dongting River, and they will hold water when we have a big rainfall and when it floods into these two lakes and fill them up. Along Yangtze River, where are our little water pockets? It eventually flows to Shanghai. And we have much lower water levels in Yangtze River now compared to in the past. And what used to be rivers is now grasslands. Poyang River is a small branch of, that flows into Yangtze River. And people in Poyang region say, well, we don't want to have this water flow away. And we're not going to build, and we, and we want to build a dam to hold the water to ourselves. But I asked them, if you build the dam, if there's no water going into the Yangtze River, what river, what water are people outside our region, what are they going to, what are they going to drink? Often people say that I'm a radical envir environmentalist, but I always say humans are more important. But do we really need so many Constructions. You remember that I talked about this ancient species of willow tree along Yellow River. It had more than 500 power stations along the Yangtze River. But we know these power stations make money. Do we really need these? How can we stop them? But what I'm saying that these small hydroelectric power stations have to be regulated. And right now, these smaller power stations along the Moon River have been under supervision by the government. So a lot of people still think that these big dams can help to clean the water. But when I was but when I was speaking to German experts recently, they told me that the carbon dioxide that's released in this process of building the dam is as serious and impactful as methane.
他是一个，他我们后来他告诉我们，他是一个地质学家。我说你怎么看的水坝 ？He was a geologist. He says dam dams are zero pollution, but I tell him, I tell them that the Yi people in our country, they they lived alongside the river for generations, and they have this. Altruistic attitude that they're not only holding the resources to themselves. Right now, we believe that the public awareness and our public participation has an important role and potential to influence how we construct and build on these rivers. Thank you, Ms. Wang. You're like an encyclopedia of how to protect the rivers. If you would like to know more how to protect the rivers, please Kim continue the river walk. That um, we can also walk with you. Yeah, even though I'm almost seventies,、uh, I think it's all、um, receive. I receive a lot of、um, strength from nature and also a lot of、uh, wisdoms. And a lot of people tell me they I think know the important emergencies of environmental protection. So what can I do as an individual? I think we heard the answer today. And it's never too late to start. Now I want to share a story with you. My son is seven years old, and one day when I was watching a documentary, Planet Earth, I, think, I told him that some landscapes and creatures in the film had disappeared. He reacted sadly, and he said, "I'm only seven years old and have not appreciated the beauty of the world. This year is about to be destroyed." Which let me think: if we want to continue human civilization, we must first have a sustainable earth. The choices we make today will affect the world that our future generation will live in. Thanks again to our three speakers, and I wish them good health and stay energetic. Thank you all for taking the time to participate, and thank you for today's、uh, interpreter.